Greetings to you, my friends, on the unceded land of the Silic Okanagan people. I am speaking to you from the land of the Kaurna people in what is now Adelaide, South Australia. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share with you some thoughts on the creative journey we all pursue and the red lions that can scare us off the path. They natter away, yammering their crazy talk. What have you accomplished with sharing with such a special group of people? You are sure to disappoint them. As I always do when asked to give a presentation on anything, I cruise the internet, read frantically, amass tons of information I will never use, and generally stir the waters of my mind into a frothy mess. But I have a powerful tool when I sense the threat of my red lions. It is the Red Lion, a Persian tale published nearly 40 years ago by New York storyteller Diane Wolkstein. It has brought me safely home more times than I can count. I'd like to share a brief version of it. The story tells of Azgid, a young Persian prince. When the king died, Azgid had to undergo a traditional test. He had to show his courage by facing the red lion. As anyone would be, he was terrified. In the dead of night, he mounted his horse and rode away from the kingdom. He rode all night and into the next day. Entering a forest, he heard sweet music. He followed the sound until he came to a clearing. A shepherd was playing his sitar as sheep grazed around him. The shepherd invited him to stay and asked, he thought, oh, this is why I left my kingdom, to find such peace. When shadows lengthened, the shepherd said urgently, we must return to the village. Oh, why not stay here, where it is so peaceful, asked Azgid. The shepherd pulled up one of his sleeves and showed angry scars. The red lion stalks these woods at night. I stayed out too late once. Reluctantly, Azgid mounted his horse. I must leave you. I thank you for your kindness. Once again, Azgid rode through the night and into the next day. He came upon a desert encampment. The sheik invited him to dine. He watched his young visitor carefully. At day's end, he said, you are welcome to join us here. The desert people wanted the young visitor to stay. So the sheik gave him a fine horse and invited him to ride with them. Aski thought, oh, this is why I left my home, to become part of these honorable and generous people. But then the sheik added, before you can become one of us, you must prove your courage by facing the red lion. That night, a saddened Azgid quietly mounted his own horse and rode through the night. The next day, he came to the gates of a walled city. He asked the guards to take him to the emir. The emir was impressed with the quiet, strong demeanor of his unexpected guest and invited him to dine with him. But first, he said, my daughter will show you the palace gardens. Watching the beautiful young woman, Asgid thought, oh, this is why I left my kingdom. Perhaps one day the emir will allow us to marry. After dinner, the emir and Asgid talked for hours in the library. 
Finally, the emir yawned and said, I will show you to your room at the top of the stairs. As the emir opened the library door, Osgid heard a lion roar. What is that? Our guard lion, said the emir. He won't harm you. I'm not yet tired. Uh, I will, uh, I'll stay in the library for a while. Osgid closed the door. Before long, he heard the lion pacing outside, roaring softly. Osgid realized the red lion was telling him, if you do not go home and face your own red lions, you will find red lions everywhere. Just before dawn, Asgid began the long ride back to his kingdom. He was ready to face his red lion. On the day of his challenge, the stands filled with visitors from around the kingdom. The shepherd was there. So was the desert sheik. So too were the emir and his daughter. Asgid entered the ring, weapon in hand, and waited. The gate opened and the red lion bounded toward him. Asgid was afraid, but determined. The lion leaped over his head. Asgid swirled to face him and saw the red lion rolling in the sand, enjoying a good scratch. The lion was tame. The red lions had always been tame. Only fear made them dangerous. Osgid was crowned king. In time, he married the emir's daughter. Together, they ruled the kingdom wisely and well. Storytelling has been at the heart of my work as a school librarian as a traveling professional storyteller, as a community development consultant, and most recently, as a writer and photographer. Along the way, I learned from some brave lion tamers. I want to introduce some of them to you. Eight-year-old Robbie Curry applied to be part of the Long Ridge Storytellers. I was a school librarian in Rochester, New York, telling stories to 24 classes a week. I wanted the children to experience some of the joy that I felt as I watched them absorbed in my words. The Long Ridge students were <laughs> pretty young, grades K through three. I figured the third graders were old enough to be part of a storytelling troupe. I talked it up with third grade classes and with my parent volunteers. I created an application form and waited. Robbie Curry was one of the first to apply. He was one of those good, quiet children who disappear in the controlled chaos of a large class. I could not fathom his wanting to be a storyteller. Uh, but his mother was one of my best parent volunteers and she had signed his application Later, she told me, I asked him why he wanted to do it when he was so shy. He said to me, Mom, I think it's time I stop being so shy. Well, Robbie learned his story and everyone else's. He gave every young performer total attention. When they lost the thread of their stories, he would mouth the words to them. When we took the children to other schools, a, a mall, and to perform, perform on public radio, Robbie was their finest cheerleader. Robbie's red line was fear of standing out and standing up. He turned it into a pet. I was telling stories regularly at the Oxcart Bookshop. The Rochester Storytelling Guild held a farewell party for me before I moved to Seattle, Washington. I wanted to be remembered for my superb last story. I decided to learn Maria Polishkin's tale, The Little Hen and the Giant. The hen is tired of the farmer stealing her eggs to appease the giant. He's a bully, 
that giant loves eggs. So one day, the hen hops off her nest and marches off to stop him. Two days in a row, she goads him into running after her and exhausts him on a merry chase. On the third day, she leads him to a deep body of water. He's running so fast he can't stop, and he drowns. She walks home to lay some eggs. Four years later, I was telling stories and giving workshops for audiences of all ages, and I'd been tapped to serve on the board of the National Storytelling Association. The chance to participate in a storytelling conference in the city where my storytelling career had started was too good to pass up. That is when I learned the impact of my pancake flat story. Paula Ziegelstein had been in the audience for the little hen story, which I had never told again. She saw me at the conference and made a beeline to thank me for a story that had changed her life. I was shocked when she said it was the little hen and the giant. She promised to bring proof the next day. Listening to the story, she had heard her red lion's roar. She realized she was letting the giants in her life steal her eggs. Keeping that story in her heart, she began to celebrate her body, her skills, and her worth. For her 40th birthday, she commissioned a small sculpture of a voluptuous woman dressed in a low-cut evening gown with the head of a chicken. Years later, I was living on a small ranch in central British Columbia, too far from paying storytelling markets and too busy with animals to keep traveling for gigs. I had turned my storytelling skills into a new career as a community development consultant. After a long stretch of wrestling with the red lion of imposter syndrome, I had realized that working with communities was all about storytelling. An organization or a community was bogged down in a story that was no longer working for them. They wanted an objective outsider to help them uncover the new story that would guide them onward. Since my professional work still revolved around storytelling, I shouldn't have been surprised when Anne, the director of the Women's Center in Williams Lake, asked me to direct a performance of the Vagina Monologues. Turnabout is, after all, fair play. The year before, I had nudged her into directing it. I thought the town could use a wake-up call about women as an equal part of the human equation. The sold-out audience had loved it. Now, she felt it was my turn. I was a storyteller, not an actor, and certainly not a director, but she refused to accept my excuses. I was determined to make room for anyone who wanted to be part of it, regardless of their skills on stage. After the first couple of read-throughs, I said to Anne, we have no talent here. What we did have was time. Instead of assigning roles and working on the script, The women shared their own stories. The room was full of red lions. But as they told their stories, the women gave each other courage. So when it came to assign roles, they knew which ones were right for them. Those who did not want to do solo readings became part of choral performances or worked backstage. They practiced, coached each other, and honed their pieces. When the last word was spoken, the last song sung, the audience rose to its feet, cheering the bravery and honesty of the women on stage, the women in their lives. A couple of years later, in the aftermath of a major life transition, I picked up the phone and called Stagebridge Senior Theater in Oakland, California. They were advertising for a storytelling director with experience in storytelling, education, and community development. When the theater director answered the phone, I told him, 
I think you're looking for me. For the next 15 months, I taught seniors to tell stories and then took them into grade four and five classes in Oakland. The schools were all considered underperforming. I led a pilot project to see if storytelling could improve reading scores by inspiring children to see a reason for literacy. It worked because of people like Jim McWilliams. Jim had worked as a civil rights lawyer in the South. He'd been friends with Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, and other civil rights activists. He was charismatic. His words were mesmerizing. In retirement, he was inspiring young black youth to believe in themselves. One day, he taught me a red lion lesson that will stay with me forever. He was a regular storyteller for a grade five class in a rough neighborhood. They hung on his every word, except this day. He stopped in the middle of the story, looked around at the quiet, kids and said, what's wrong? We're dumb kids. What do you mean you're dumb kids? They showed him a newspaper clipping. The school was slated to be closed because it was underperforming. They would all be shipped off to schools in neighborhoods where they knew no one. They were afraid. So Jim listened to them and said, so Are you dumb kids? No! Then you have to act. Jim gave them a lesson in organizing that probably changed the trajectory of some of their lives. He had them write letters to the school board and demand an in-person hearing. He'd go with them, but they would do the talking. They were excited. Maybe they weren't dumb kids. Maybe they could change things. He warned them, they've made up their minds. They are going to close your school, but you will show them that you are not dumb kids. They presented their case to the school board and got press attention for doing so. The school was closed, but the kids were not shut down. They learned they were bright and deserved as good an education as their peers in the rich neighborhoods. They would face red lions the rest of their lives. But Jim McWilliams gave them tools to do so. Those darn red lions still stalk me, as they do all of us. I'm pretty sure they followed me to Australia. They temporarily befuddle me, but they do not stop me. Storytelling keeps them at bay. These days, that mostly means writing and photography. In 2008, I retired from my position as food security project manager with Interior Health. I was working with communities that wanted to change their stories around food and health. Sometimes the health authority called on me to teach organizational storytelling at a time when that was still a relatively new concept. Now I'm retired and turning 75. I don't have time for red lions. I still pace on the periphery, but I have too many books to create to take them seriously. So here's what my creative life looks like now. Plants, animals, and people fascinate me endlessly. After taking a photography course and learning how to use new publishing software, I started creating books with Blurb. Then I decided I should check out Amazon. I started with two books of hope-filled essays and a book about the stories that clouds tell. My first publication foray with Ingram was a series of children's books based on the true story of a brave little hen. I collaborated on a book with poet Marilyn Raymond, her poems, My Images, published another book about Kelowna, 
and a journal of hope. When I imported my photographs from camera to computer, I, I saw that they were full of small stories. I began posting them on Instagram and Facebook, like these two. Uh, the one on the right is one of my favorites. What happened to you, shrimp? Tall boy looked down at the bedraggled cone. Skateboarders, sighed shrimp. The newbies are pretty hard on me, but I got my revenge. I tripped a few of them. That led to publication of 10 small books of small-scale stories, all of them available on both Amazon and Ingram. Some people create scrapbooks. I put personal and family stories into books and then give them as gifts. Photographing the natural world around me has become a passion. I take my camera with me everywhere. The rainbow lorikeet on the left was in Melbourne, and the tree on the right was in Kasagai Garden in Kelowna. Turtles cooperate for photographs, like this western painted in Kasagai and the ones on a log out in Wilden. Sometimes nature stuns me with its beauty, like these ice formations on Okanagan Lake. Or this sunset over the same lake that still makes me gasp when I look at it. When I chanced upon an online class in digital art, I knew I had to give it a try because I had all the tools, so why not? I started to experiment with different effects in Photoshop and different actions. Robin was a willing subject and I wanted to kind of capture the joy that you all know he has. The course is taught by Sebastian Michaels. I think he's one of the best. It taught me to use different effects, textures, overlays, and also, and equally and perhaps even more important, how to do photo compositions like this one I did of our granddaughter Sunday. This one is one of my favorites. The child is a granddaughter of friends of ours in Sydney. The tree was also taken in Australia, probably in Melbourne, and the roots had all kinds of animals and figures. I wonder how many you can pick out. Those of you who have followed my relationship with Roscoe the Crow will probably also recognize the gazebo that's on the top of a hill in Waterfront Park. That's in the composition on the left side. On the right side is one that I created for Denise Brownlee. She was feeling as if her body was a broken tree. I wanted something to show her beauty in the sunset of her life. And on it goes into however long my future may be. As long as my energy lasts and my passion keeps burning, I will create. We are all called to be the truest versions of ourselves. Sometimes the red lions keep us from daring to walk proudly in the world. We don't have to let them. Turn around and face them. The surprising reality is that many of them turn out to be pussycats. Maybe even most of them. But definitely not all. I'd like to finish with a story that I learned years ago from New York storyteller Laura Sims. It's one of the many Hoja tells. One day the Hoja was playing his kamacha in his house. And it sounded kind of like this. Actually, he went on a lot longer than I did. 
long enough that his wife came out from the kitchen and she said, Nasruddin, all the other men, when they play the Comanche, they play it up and down the strings. Why are you only playing one note? He smiled beatifically. Ah, oh, my dear, they are all looking for this note. So, whatever is your work, do it with a good heart and try to be a work of frolic and not a workaholic. Thank you so much again. I just wish I could be there to give you all hugs and have a chat. <laughs>